Hello, uh, this is SK Williams, and today I would like to talk to you about how religion is inherently violent. Or, more accurately, the belief that religion is inherently violent. And much more inherently violent than anything else, such as uh, politics, or science, or philosophy, or any other human enterprise. Or at least, uh, that is the common belief. But is that common belief true? It's not. But, for some odd reason, much like the idea that science and religion are incompatible and hostile to each other, uh, we as a society seem to have accepted it as a part of the general narrative culture. Historians, of course, have dismissed the conflict thesis between science and religion, but as a rule, even people in academia tend to think of religion as being more inclined to violence than other things. And while this proposition has been questioned in academia, and the academic world seems to uh, still broadly accept the notion that religion is inherently more violent, and this idea is promoted largely by people who promote secularism, which itself is odd because as with atheism we are told that secularism is simply neutrality toward religion while at the same time being told that there is such a thing as secular values. Indeed, Phil Zuckerman, who is one of the most important names in modern-day atheism because of his study that he did with Gregory S. Paul, which Richard Dawkins oddly thinks of as two separate studies, and which, being an uncharitable, evil religious person, and specifically an apologist, I suspect is done so that you can increase the number of studies, has himself founded the discipline of secular studies to go along with religious studies. Secularism is not simply an independent field, though it is an alternative to religion and an alternative to religious studies. But in order to have enough material to study and to actually accept as a discipline, you have to accept that this simple neutrality to religion that has no beliefs or values of its own has enough content to actually warrant several classes in it that you can earn a PhD in. Just as you have to accept that there is such a thing as secular values that secular people hold, while at the same time saying that, unlike religion, secularism does not tell you what values to hold, and makes no claims. Of course, secularism does make claims. Secularism has a list of values and beliefs that you must hold to in order to be classified as a secular person. And it is obvious that people like Phil Zuckerman equate secularism with humanism. Which begs the question, is it really true that we have non-religious people who embrace secularism like Phil Zuckerman, or like Richard Dawkins, or like Sam Harris, and others who are religious like me? Or do we actually have people of a religion called secularism pretending their religion is not a religion. At the core of this, of course, is the idea that religion is inherently violent, and we should embrace secularism because secularism is more peaceful. Is it?
Of course, if we understand secularism as an alternative to religion, the narrative, at least at this level of analysis, could work. But if secularism was nothing more than a religion itself, then either secularism would have to be understood as inherently violent, or at least inherently inclined to violence, just like all other religions are, or else we would have to explain why all religion is inherently violent, except the secular religion. So you need secularism to be distinct, in order to maintain the idea that it is not as violent, just as you need it to be distinct, so that you can justify saying secularism promotes science. Uh, you need it to be distinct, in order to say that secularism allows for freedom and human flourishing and other good things that religion denies, or at least is inclined to deny. But at the same time, you then have to look at places like the former Soviet Union historically, or even modern-day communist China, and say they are not secular. They are not really like us. Which is what we see. Many even claim that communism is a form of religion. Uh, Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens, for instance, in their books, claim that communism is a form of religion. At the same time, they insist that they aren't religious, and secularism isn't religious, and if you call them religious, it's silly since, well, they're atheists. And atheism is not a religion. Atheism is a lack of belief in a god. Atheism is a religion like bald as a hair color. Atheism is a religion like not playing sports as a sport. Atheism is a religion like not collecting stamps as a hobby. I don't really believe atheism is a lack of belief in a god. Atheists actually do say God doesn't exist, often explicitly saying God does not exist. They will ridicule the idea of God calling God a delusion, calling people who believe in God delusional, uh, referring to God as people's imaginary friend, and so forth. Uh, that isn't the topic of the video, but it is an important thing to note to make the video make sense. Uh, I don't really believe atheism is a lack of belief in a god. They will never address why I say that, though. They will only address that I say that, and then ridicule me for ignoring the definition of the word and how I'm ignoring evidence. Of course, a dictionary definition is not evidence. It is simply a definition you find in a dictionary, but to them I'm ignoring evidence, all while they refuse to acknowledge why it is that I'm saying what, it, what I'm saying. They refuse to acknowledge the explanation I give. And therein lies the problem, you see. Because the same issue happens with secularism. Just as they want you to accept that atheism is a lack of belief in a god, not a belief that god does not exist, and that atheists make no claims and have no burden of proof, they want you to accept that secularism is nothing more than neutrality toward religion. At the same time, just as they outright declare God does not exist, they will tell you that secularists believe certain things. They will tell you that secularists and secular individuals hold certain principles. They will talk about secular values. How can you do that? If secularism is nothing more than neutrality toward religion, if secularism has no values and is simply neutrality toward religion, then how can there be such a thing as secular values? How can Phil Zuckerman teach a course where you can get a PhD in secular studies? And while Phil Zuckerman definitely proved using science that non-religious countries are less violent and better off than religious countries, and 
along with Gregory S. Pohl, prove that even in America, the secular states are less violent and better off than the religious states, the truth is he didn't really prove that at all. His survey, which wasn't really a study, uh, for one thing, would have to be repeated over a long period of time. You couldn't just take a slice out of one time period and assume it's true. Even if the data he presented was true and accurate, thus justifying the preliminary conclusion, he would have to do it several more times and see if the prediction holds up. Because if religious nations are worse off socially, economically, and morally, and are more inclined to crime or violence, then this should remain the trend no matter what time period you conduct the survey. But you can't prove it's true as a trend without conducting the same survey several times, several years apart. And yet, uh, that is exactly what we see happening. We see that one study being used. And, uh, to be perfectly honest, that one study, far from being the brilliant work of incontestable genius, which presented facts that cannot themselves be in any way contested, what we see are Zuckerman ignoring facts that don't fit his thesis. Zuckerman left off the list several nations that are majority atheist, for instance. He claimed it's because atheism was imposed by force. He does not, however, explain why imposing atheism by force should disqualify a population from being understood as majority atheist. And he also did not uh, exclude countries where religiosity, as he puts it, were actually excluded because it was imposed on them. And Zuckerman does claim that religiosity was imposed on those nations. He also wasn't entirely honest with the data. For instance, he compared the entire world, omitting certain countries that don't fit his narrative, of course. Then he compared the states within America. What he did not do is compare the states in the European Union, which at the time included the United Kingdom. And he did not compare Europe with other time periods in European history. He simply compared the entire world, compared America to Europe, and compared the states. he did not compare the states within the European Union the same way he did America. Now, I don't have the internet in front of me, and I don't have the data, but I did do that comparison, and I found out that his predictions don't hold. You cannot say, this European country is stronger in religiosity than this other country, and has a higher crime rate, and that this maintains itself. Now, I'm not claiming the pattern is actually the opposite, either. But what we actually see if we do that is more of a random mix to the point where religiosity doesn't seem to matter at all as far as the crime rates. In fact, one of the problems we have is measuring which countries are more religious than others, which ones have a higher religious salinity, as he calls it. The data he used was based solely on data where people claimed to believe certain things, but there was no other metric. 
using the same metric he did though religious salinity did not really indicate which countries would have more or less crime within the European Union. The United Kingdom, for instance, had a higher crime rate than did Malta, and the United Kingdom had a lower religious salinity. Atheists are now boasting that the United Kingdom is no longer majority Christian, and even though that wasn't necessarily true ten years ago, it was sharply declining, and yet the UK crime rates were going up, not down. So, why didn't we talk about that? Even the red state, blue state comparison didn't make any sense, considering he didn't measure religious salinity so much by census data of what people profess to believe. He gauged religious salinity when it comes to the United States purely by if you voted Democrat or Republican. That's why we have the religious red states and the secular blue states. Now, some people have countered this by pointing out that states are actually not red or blue if you look at them more regionally, and most states are more purple, because there are regions, even in blue states, where you have majority Republicans, especially in more rural areas, and regions within red states, especially in metropolitan areas, that are more Democrat. But I don't even need to go that far. Even assuming the majority of people are uniformly Democrat or Republican in a given state, all I need to do is point out that being a Democrat does not necessarily make you secular, just as being a Republican does not necessarily make you religious with how they're defining the term. And it is obvious that Zuckerman, along with Sam Harris and others, wants us to understand conservatism and religiosity to be effectively the same thing. In Sam Harris's book, which I suppose isn't really a book, it's very short, Letter to a Christian Nation, he claims that he's addressing this to a Christian, but he's not really addressing moderate or liberal Christians. He is only going to address conservative Christians because he wants to address Christianity in its most committed form. So it's obvious that in Sam Harris's mind, conservatives are committed Christians, more so than liberals, or as he puts it, moderates. But there is really no reason to think a liberal is less committed to their Christian faith than a conservative is, or that they follow a less committed form of Christianity. And the same would of course be true of other religions. What Sam Harris was arguing was oversimplistic and not very accurate where you have a simple idea where a fundamentalist and a conservative and a scriptural literalist were all the same thing, and the only difference between a conservative religious person and a liberal religious person is that the conservative takes more of his scriptures seriously than does the liberal. Sam Harris actually does indeed use those terms, take seriously. He actually claims that the liberal takes the scriptures less seriously, and all he's doing is asking them to go all the way with it and take none of it seriously, since they're already picking and choosing what parts to believe in and cherry-picking nice parts while throwing up symbolic explanations for barbaric and evil passages. And he says that without really demonstrating this is true beyond a ham-fisted explanation of how awful the Bible is using Bible verses that don't really say what he claims. For instance, he points to one verse in the Bible where he claims it says to kill your children for talking back to you, when it doesn't actually say that. It says he who smites his mother and father shall be put to death. Smiting is not the same thing as talking back to. And Sam Harris obviously wanted us to imagine a small child backtalking their parents being stoned to death when this passage is actually talking about 
attacking or assaulting them. Sam Harris does that quite often. He claims he's reading what the Bible literally says, and if anyone disagrees, well, they're simply not taking the scriptures seriously and throwing up a symbolic explanation. Oddly, though, he considers the Catholic Church conservative, which means he sees it either as a fundamentalist church or, at the least, a conservative one, because he's not very consistent in his writings. Sometimes a conservative and a fundamentalist are the same thing, and sometimes a fundamentalist would be more of an extreme form of conservatism. Nevertheless, if his distinction is that a conservative is more of a scriptural literalist, then why would the Catholic Church, which is not notorious for scriptural literalism, be understood as conservative? And it's not like modern Catholics since Vatican II have become less scriptural literalists. Allegorical interpretation is very ancient in Catholicism, and even throughout the Middle Ages was employed. So, it's not exactly true. Just as it's not true that if you vote Democrat, you must be secular versus religious. And you can't use the Sam Harris excuse, because the idea that you may think of yourself as religious, but you're cherry-picking and don't take the scripture as seriously, is simply his opinion. And it's obvious that this is something he has chosen specifically to link conservative religious belief to conservative politics, as is understood in America, and to basically make it the same thing. But there's no reason to think this is true. There's no reason to think that the conservatives actually believe the things that Sam Harris claims the Bible teaches. Sam Harris would think that means they don't believe the Bible, but what it really means is they don't believe Sam Harris, and they don't believe Sam Harris's interpretation of various Bible verses. There is a very big difference between not believing Sam Harris's understanding of the Bible and not believing the Bible. And just dismissing that as mental gymnastics to deny the Bible means what it clearly and plainly says, and that the atheist is just giving the plain reading of the text, is just begging the question. Why should we accept that, uh, for example, when Sam Harris claims that Exodus 21.15, Leviticus 29, Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, Mark 7, 9 through 13, and Matthew 15, 4 through 7, tells us that if our children are shameless enough to talk back to us, we should kill them. Is that what any of these verses actually say? According to Sam Harris, it is, and according to Sam Harris, I'm being a religious liberal or a religious moderate who's throwing up a symbolic interpretation of them if I disagree, and of course I'm arguing in bad faith, he's rather famous for saying that. It's obvious that what Sam Harris is saying is simply the truth. But is it? If you actually were to read Exodus 21.15, for example, what would it actually say? Well, it does not say that if your child is shameless enough to talk back to you, you should kill them. What it really says is as follows, taken from the authorized version of the Bible, also known as the King James Version. It is in America in the public domain, and so that's why it is selected. It is also well known. But because the point is that I don't agree with their assessment that religion is inherently violent. And I'm only trying to demonstrate that they have a bias against religion in general and Christianity in particular, knowing full well the excuse is they only focus on Christianity because it's the most popular religion. I don't believe that excuse, but that's for another time. I'm really not going to dwell on this and I'm not going to go through multiple examples. Uh, 
So I'm going to read a bit more from a letter to a Christian nation to you, and I'm going to omit the scriptural references except the ones that I'm using to make this point. But the point is true of other references they make, such as when Sam Harris claims the Bible gives detailed instructions on how to sell your daughter as a sex slave, which makes it sound like there's page after page after page of it, when in reality he only can cite a few verses, and even then it's not really true that they're saying you sell them as a sex slave, just as it's not really true that the Bible's only limitation on slavery is that you cannot damage their teeth and eyes. What he's saying is simplistic and ham-fisted and inaccurate and wrong. But it does tie to his assessment of why religion is uniquely violent, and it's one that is also promoted by the late Christopher Hitchens, the late uh, Dr. Hector Avalos, the late Richard Dawkins. And by the way, I don't mention Dr. Richard Dawkins because this is not his field of expertise. It is not a diminutive, it is not an insult or a slight. It's just that he doesn't have a relevant degree in this field. Having said that, I am going to read an extract from Letter to a Christian Nation, simply to make a point about why I don't actually trust Sam Harris. Not when it comes to understanding religion or what the Bible says. And again, I will be omitting certain scriptural references because I'm focusing on one point. And he is talking about how the Bible should not be understood as teaching us how to be moral because the Bible is actually immoral. So, to quote him, Admittedly, God's counsel to parents is straightforward. Whenever children get out of line, we should beat them with a rod. If they are shameless enough to talk back to us, we should kill them. Now, here are the verses he uses to support the claim that, according to the Bible, if our children are shameless enough to talk back to us, we should kill them. Exodus 21.15 Leviticus 29 Deuteronomy 21.18-21 And two New Testament verses that I will get to shortly, but will leave out for now. What does Exodus 21.15 actually say? Well, I've already told you, it doesn't say if your child talks back to you, kill them, it's talking about smiting, but just to be very clear, I shall read it from the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible. And he that smiteth father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Smiteth, not talks back to. Smite does not mean talk back to. Smite means to strike or to hit or attack. And the word smite is used to convey a sort of assault that is malevolent or harsh. To read the dictionary definition of the word smite, in much the same way the atheist community claims to prove things like atheism is a lack of belief in a god, and claims to justify its other issues. But, knowing that I will be called a hypocrite since I find their argument a dictionarium faulty, uh, keep in mind, I don't think dictionaries are worthless, but I do think that using them as absolute authority is wrong. Nevertheless, the question of what the word smite means is relevant since the whole point hinges on whether smite means talk back to, and whether we should imagine a small child of around 8 to 12 years old talking back to their parents and being killed for it, or whether uh, this is talking about something else entirely. So, uh, to read the definition of the word smite in the dictionary, and this is taken from the Oxford American Desk Dictionary and Thesaurus, 
which I'm using because I don't have that many resources available. I am making this video without benefit of internet access, and I am also making it while trying to rebuild my life a couple of years ago, my house burned down. But nevertheless, reading this one dictionary definition, where there's actually three, and I'll read all three, but I think we can all agree that the first one is the most relevant one here. Smite. Hit with a hard blow. That is the first definition. One. Hit with a hard blow. Two. Be strongly attracted to someone. Three. Be severely affected by, such as a disease. I doubt when it says he who smites his parents, it is referring to being severely affected by his parents. Or him severely affecting his parents, although I suppose if one were to hit them, they would be severely affected. And I doubt it's talking about being attracted to them. Uh, to belabor this point, because you almost have to with the activist atheist to embrace militant atheism, the sort that complain about being called militant atheists because they're not lobbing bombs and not being violent. Uh, the same sort that would say a militant Christian would be represented by a crusader knight holding a sword aloft saying, God wills it as he kills someone, or an abortion clinic bomber blowing smoke from a gun barrel as he planned parenthood burns in the background, and a, a militant Muslim is one with a suicide vest shouting Allahu Akbar while blowing up people while a militant atheist is one who's simply sipping coffee peacefully in a coffee shop. An image they like to foster even as violence against uh, Christians in Europe grows and between 2019 and 2020 increased by 70 percent and even in America we see an increase in violent hate crimes against Christians perpetuated by people who happen to be saying all the same things that other people in the herd of cats are saying by sheer coincidence. But it is obvious even from this example that the word smite is not meant to convey talking back to. So, uh, to continue with why I don't think Exodus 2115 should be understood as a promotion of killing a small child for talking back to his parents. I am now reading to you from Rogets 2, the new thesaurus. Smite. 1. To deliver a powerful blow suddenly and sharply. 2. To bring great harm or suffering. Does that sound like Exodus is attempting to convey that if a small child talks back to his parents, they should be killed? Sam Harris thinks so. But, to belabor the point further, in a way that should be unnecessary, but isn't, considering the extent of which uh, the not-so-militant, completely peaceful atheist community operates. I am now reading from the New World Dictionary of the American Language, Second College Edition, Deluxe Color Edition. Smite. One. Now rare in literature. A. To hit or strike hard. B. To bring into a specific condition by or as by a blow. To smite someone dead, as an example. And keep in mind, this says rare in literature, but the King James Bible is from the 1600s. So the fact that it is now rare in literature does not mean it was in the 1600s. And indeed, we almost assuredly know that 
as Sam Harris had the King James Bible in mind when he wrote this, since when he sparingly refers to biblical passages and actually quotes them, which doesn't happen that often, he would almost invariably do so uh, by quoting from the King James. He does this in the end of faith, for example. Or he'll attempt Bible talk, where he uses words like smite or hath or such, and he often gets those wrong, but that's not relevant. Moving on, though, to two. To strike or attack with a powerful or disastrous effect. Interesting how the second definition doesn't exactly help with the first one. After all, according to Sam Harris, Exodus 21.15 is about parenting advice, and is telling parents to kill children for talking back to them. This does not sound so, does it? 3. To affect strongly and suddenly. 4. To disquiet mentally, distress. 5. To strike or impress favorably. Inspire with a hit or a strike. As you can see from the readings of these definitions, they don't help each other to form a picture of this being about talking back to someone, and they don't really support what Sam Harris is saying is parenting advice in the Bible. That, according to Exodus 21.15, if your child talks back to you, you should kill them. That is very obviously not what this is saying. And, while I will be accused of doing the out-of-context excuse like we dishonest Christian apologists always do, and I am assuredly an apologist since I'm defending Christianity, which means I'm inherently a liar for Jebus, who is operating in an inherently dishonest field called apologetics, where I begin with my conclusion and work backwards, quite unlike the atheist who merely looks at the facts and uh, follows them where it leads. Uh, keep in mind, uh, you can't dismiss what I'm saying just by pointing out that because I'm a Christian apologist, I'm inherently dishonest. Especially since one of the lies for Jebus that I tell is that I'm not actually an apologist. And what's more, I'm not an apologist. Even if I were an apologist, I would not be an apologist. And the atheist community doesn't understand that because they don't understand poetic or constructive language. When they use the word apologist, they may tell you it means the definition they would find in a dictionary, but they really just mean someone who is lying to defend their faith. Uh, but... Even though they'd say that no one has ever been converted to Christianity through apologetics and it only exists to give rationalizations for beliefs you already have and to keep people in the faith, and they say that apologetics is inherently dishonest, keep in mind, they don't have a good track record of honesty themselves. And one of the things they will say is that Christians say, out of context, and they call it the out of context excuse. And of course, Christians are hypocrites for saying that, since Christians will often quote only one Bible verse. Quoting one verse, however, is not taking it out of context. Out of context is referring to the practice of ignoring the surrounding context of a quote, isolating it, and presenting it, but giving it a meaning that is very clearly not the one that is intended in context. Quoting a single verse is not the issue, it's the misrepresentation of them. And in this case, Harris doesn't 
quote the verse for good reason. He wants you to think the Bible is giving parenting advice that says to kill children who talk back to you in order to show you how awful and barbaric and immoral the Bible is. And he's obviously not right about it. Now, some of you may ask, well, isn't that silly? How can a small child hit their parents hard enough to kill them? Well, for one thing, depending upon the age of the child especially, a child could do that. But the verse doesn't actually say child, and even if it does, in the ancient world, and in fact in most societies in humanity's history, children didn't leave home at 18 to go to college or go to work and buy their own house. They lived on familial land generation after generation. So when the Bible talks about children, it's not always talking about small children before uh, they turn 18 or something along those lines and move out. The child was never expected to move out when they became an adult and buy their own house. That's not how ancient societies tended to work. So often it is actually talking about an adult who is doing this. Which should be borne in mind, considering that uh, Exodus 21 is not giving parental advice. Uh, the purpose of the 21st chapter of Exodus is to give law codes about what to do with various people who do certain things. Which is why most of the verse has nothing to most of the verses in the chapter have absolutely nothing to do with raising children. This is not a chapter giving a parenting advice. This is a chapter giving laws for Israel. That's why if you read just three verses up, it says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. This is a law code that is telling you what to do if people do certain things. That is also why it talks about, supposedly at least, slavery. And why the atheist community loves it, because it brings up the infamous verse where it says it's morally acceptable to beat your slave so long as they don't die, or so long as you don't hurt their teeth or eyes, or some even argue that it says that you can even beat your slave to death so long as it takes two or three days to die. It's obvious that we've all heard the lame joke. The Bible does not need atheists to make it look bad. The Bible does that all by itself. And of course you can replace the word Bible with Christianity, with Christians, with God, with whatever. But nevertheless, it's very obvious that if that were true, they wouldn't have to go out of the way to depict the Bible in the worst possible way, and that is what they're doing here. They are going out of their way to depict the Bible in the worst possible light. They are trying to depict it in the worst possible way, and to do so, they uh, twist what it's saying to make it sound worse than it really is, and to give it a new meaning that is worse than is really being said. So, simply repeating that lame joke that the Bible doesn't need atheists to make it look bad, it does that all by itself, is itself simply a dishonest tactic designed to deflect from the fact that the atheist is actually lying. If you were to read Exodus 21, 12 through 15, you would get the sense that this is talking about what happens when someone assaults someone, it is a law code that is describing penalties. And I frankly don't care if people agree with the death penalty or not, that is not the point that's being made here. The point that's being made here is that Exodus 21.15 is not parenting advice. It is a law that talks about someone smiting his father or mother, and it doesn't even mention the word child in the English translations here. So it's rather silly to think that this verse is supposed to be parenting advice. It's not like it was mentioning random morals and then just happens to include parenting advice in this one verse. And it coincidentally happens to be surrounded by other verses that are about smiting people, or at least it is preceded by them. The actual next verse is about stealing men. 
Exodus 21, 12 through 15 read as follows, from the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, then shalt thou take him from mine altar, that he may die. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. These laws were not parenting advice and were not telling you to kill your child for talking back to you. It is irrelevant that the great divine prophet Sam Harris most holy did decree it in his sacred scriptures, a letter to a Christian nation, and that the divine prophet most holy Sam Harris speaks the sacred words of reason and no God. What matters is that he lied, and that he misrepresented the text. So, again, repeating that lame joke that the Bible doesn't need atheists to make it look bad, the Bible does that all by itself, is simply denying reality, since it is obvious that the atheist community that follows people like the divine prophet Sam Harris Most Holy certainly are trying to make it look bad. But therein lies the question, what about the other verses? Of course, most of you have already figured out by now that they are of absolutely no aid to defend what Sam Harris said. Even if those verses were to support him, he still lied about the Exodus, and let's face reality, what are the odds that he was honest about what they said? Well, let's find out, just in case. Leviticus 29 is the next up. Is it giving parenting advice, and is it saying if your child talks back to you, kill them? Let's find out. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 9, read from the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. Now, while the atheist community likes saying curse means using bad language like F-bombs or the S-word that means excrement, that I can't safely say, of course, thanks to Al Gore and how it disrupts his rhythm, if you know what I mean. The truth is, to curse is not simply using profanity as we understand it today. It's very obvious that when it says to curse your parents, it's talking about something else. I frankly don't care if the atheist community also throws up the excuse that curses aren't real either, this is belief in magic. The point being made is that Sam Harris lied about this being parenting advice telling you to kill your child if he talks back to you. And the word curse does not actually necessarily mean what they think it does. It does not mean using bad language. It actually means something else entirely, especially in the original Hebrew, where the word has a connotation of contempt and malice that I can't go into now because this video is already going to be a very long one, but I hope to do one on it soon. But the point being made here is that it is not simply about talking back to your parents or using what we would call curse words. It is talking about something else entirely, and it is not parenting advice saying to kill your child if he talks back to you. Sam Harris lied about what this verse is saying. And that brings us to Deuteronomy 21.18. So, dear listener, before I read Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 to you, what do you think the odds are that it says, uh, this is parental advice? 
if your child talks back to you, kill them. What are the odds, dear listener, that Sam Harris was telling you the truth about Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 through 21, which I shall now read, taken again from the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that, when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold upon him, and bring him out unto the elders of the city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die, so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. While this verse may still seem barbaric because, well, let's face it, the atheist community is looking for excuses anyway to find it barbaric, and the whole, the Bible doesn't need atheists to make it look bad, it does that all by itself joke is rather a distraction that's meant to deflect from the actual point that's being made. Uh, the problem is this. While I hope to go into greater detail about what this actually means later. It's still not about a small child who talks back to his parents and being killed. It's talking about a stubborn and rebellious son who won't obey. That is not the same thing as back-talking. And in this context, it's not saying, little Timmy refused to clean his room once, let's go kill him. It's obvious that it has to be ongoing since uh, he won't obey even after being chastened. So it's not like the very first time little Timmy is told to clean his room and refuses to, he is killed. And it's also not true that there is no trial, since they obviously take him to the elders, and that would be how a trial worked in this society. And considering that little Timmy, who's refusing to clean his room, is actually called a glutton and a drunkard, it's obvious that he is an adult and that the situation is more serious than refusing to clean his room. Incidentally, I've actually heard some atheists say, it doesn't actually say your child is a glutton and a drunkard, it just says to tell the elders that, as if this is telling them to lie to the elders or that this is some sort of ritual response. It's fairly obvious that the actual issue is being a glutton or a drunkard or something along those lines, and considering that the society they lived in by the way, they also have a way of justifying saying that women were sex slaves, that way is to say that the Bible says you can sell your daughters as sex slaves, and if someone were to respond to them and say it doesn't actually say that they are sex slaves, to say it may not actually say that, but considering the times, we know what they would be used for. So, when inevitably I am told it doesn't actually say this in the text, keep in mind that my dishonest apologetics that starts at its conclusion and works backwards because I'm lying for Jebus is the same as the honest atheist who looks at the evidence objectively and follows it where it leads. Being a glutton and a drunkard may not seem like something to kill someone over today, but we, li we are talking about a time period when you had to grow all of your own food, or at least most of it, and where someone who is a glutton and a drunkard is wasting resources and not providing for the family or contributing to its defense. This is not a time where you could call 911 and expect a prompt police response. This is not a time when you could rely on a safe community. Raiders could come in and take what you have, for instance. A failed crop could mean the death of all of you. And again, this isn't a time where people lived in a nuclear family, even though certain atheists today, like the liar of Zod, think the Gospels put Jesus in a nuclear family for whatever reason. This is a time period when extended families lived on the same ancestral land for years. And the rebellious son could 
easily lead to someone dying as a result. And for those of you who would contradict me by saying, Oh, so you're saying that part of the Bible is outdated. What if other parts are outdated? Wouldn't an omniscient God know better? Keep in mind, my actual argument is that the claims that religion is inherently violent aren't true, and I'm only using this as an example of why we should not trust the assessment of the completely peaceful, not militant atheists who make these arguments. And that's because they lie. Even if this verse was inexcusably barbaric, it's still not talking about a small child talking back to their parents, and it is still not giving parental advice to say to kill your parent for talking back to you. Sam Harris is still a liar regardless. But what about the New Testament verses he invoked, where he mentioned, for some reason, Mark 7, 9... Through 13, and Matthew 15, 4 through 7. To go in his order, even though it's not the same order that these books appear in the Bible, and one could possibly justify this by claiming Mark was written first, but he that wouldn't stand up if you were to actually read his other works, but nevertheless, let's find out if Matthew or Mark, are giving parental advice that says if a child talks back to you, to kill them. Starting in Mark 7, 9-13. Mark! Oh, of course, before I begin, I am... As ever, I am taking this from the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible. So, Mark, uh, chapter 7, verse 9, reading until verse 13. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and whosoever curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, it is a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father and his mother. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. I suppose he is saying that because it says whosoever curseth his mother and father shall die again, that it is saying if a child backtalks his parents they would be killed. But Jesus is not giving parental advice here. And again, a curse is not simply saying bad words like we think of them. And what is being said here is very different than simply a child backtalking his parents. I don't need to belabor it, although I might have to considering how militant atheists are, but I've already explained it in the previous verses because Jesus is referring uh, to Torah here and what it says. But that brings us to Matthew 15, verse 4. What do you suppose it says? Well, let's find out. Once again, I shall be reading from the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible, and I shall be reading from Matthew chapter 15, verse 4 through 7. For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest profit by me. And honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. 
ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I actually included verse 8. I don't know why uh, Harris did not. Nevertheless, this is still a reference to the earlier uh, verses in Torah, and the same as I said of Mark applies. To curse your father and mother is not the same thing as back-talking them, and it is not the same thing as using curse words the way we mean it. So what Sam Harris is actually saying is not really the truth. And if he's wrong about what the Bible actually says, what makes you think he's right about its calls for violence or the beliefs that Christians actually hold? The truth of the matter is, they never quite explain how religion is inherently violent. Not in a way that is coherent and makes sense. A good example of that would be why I focus on Sam Harris here. Because he claims Jainism is peaceful. But at the same time, one of his core arguments is that all of the world's religions begin with the belief that the creator of the universe wrote only one holy book. And that holy book is their religion's holy book. And that it has exclusive claims of the truth. No other book is true or infallible or written by the creator of the universe. And that other religions are, at best, repositories of truth and error containing a dangerous mix of uh, true things and false things. But he doesn't really prove that. He just asserts it's true. And at the same time, he claims that because they believe there is one and only one book written by the creator of the universe, and all other holy books that claim to be written by the creator of the universe are wrong, and because we have a plethora of such holy books claiming to be written by the creator of the universe that contain contradictory things, both between each other and even in their own pages, conflict is inevitable as people insist their holy book was written by the creator and not others, and have this intractable position, making all religions violent. He then explains that if you meet a tolerant religious person, uh, this is because of secularism, not because of religion, because secularism is tolerant, and uh, the religious person has become a moderate because of uh, secular learning and scriptural ignorance. The moderate believer is someone who cherry-picks what part of their holy book to believe, and is not as committed to their religion, and does not believe in everything it teaches. And we have a situation where religious people can tolerate other religious people, or people of no religion like him, precisely because of secularism. Which is why he argues that secularists should stop being tolerant of religion, and why religious moderates are as much of a problem, since they give a legitimacy to fundamentalism, which we all know is taking the scriptures seriously, unlike the moderates who don't, Believing what it actually says, being scriptural literalist, and therefore hating everyone who is not a believer in religion, or who believes in the wrong religion, or even people who have the wrong interpretation of religion. Therefore, religion is inherently violent and inherently intolerant. Moderate believers are only moderate because of secularism. And oh, secular society should stop being tolerant as a result. But then he praises the Jains as peaceful. Wouldn't his argument apply to them, though? Don't the Jains have a religion that begins with a one book they believe is written by the creator of the universe that claims exclusively to hold the truth and that alone is infallible? Don't the Jains know that other religions have holy books that they claim to be written by the creator of the universe but are wrong? How can a Jain respect or tolerate people of other religions? Obviously, the Jains are just as much a 
powder keg, ready to explode as other religions, and just as willing to be violent. Aren't they? Of course, Sam Harris is really simply targeting Christianity and Islam. But he wants to pretend he's targeting religion in general. And what he said is silly, because not all religions begin with the belief that the creator of the universe wrote one book. Not all religions even have a holy book that is central to their religion. Most don't. But this is nevertheless the core of why Sam Harris claims religion is inherently violent. And it doesn't really make any sense. Which is why he distracts you from it, so that hopefully you'll read it, accept it as true without thinking about it or doing much research, and then think about all those awful, terrible, horrible Bible verses. Which he lies about. But therein lies the problem. Uh, Sam Harris is not altogether honest about what it is that Christians believe, or for that matter, what it is Muslims believe, or what the Quran says, or what the Bible says. And yet he will use verses from these texts to prove how violent Christianity is, or how violent Islam is. And there is no reason to believe he is giving us the plain reading of the text, and that anyone who disagrees with him is using mental gymnastics to deny the Bible means what it clearly and plainly says. The idea that if you say it doesn't mean what Sam Harris claims it means, you're throwing up a symbolic meaning so that you don't have to admit how barbarous your religion is and you're being a religious moderate, doesn't mean anything if he can't show us the religious fundamentalists who agree with him about what these verses are saying and claim that they are justifying their violence, and of course he can't. I've already used one example, his claim that the Bible gives parenting advice uh, that says to kill your child if he talks back to you, which is actually a law of Israel and not parental advice, and is talking about someone who assaults their parents, not someone who simply talks back to them. And it's obvious that it is intent on discussing adults who assault their parents, not children, and not children simply talking back to them. That is why the authorised King James Version uses the word smite. To return to Exodus chapter 21 verse 15, why should we think what he said was true when it is obviously not true? I'm going to read it again, this time from the Bible in basic English. Any man who gives a blow to his father or his mother is certainly to be put to death. And now I shall read it from the uh, New Heart translation, or specifically the New Heart English Bible. Anyone who attacks his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. I suppose one could say an attack could be a verbal attack, but it is rather obvious that this is not what is the intended meaning. So, what do the other Bible translations say, do you know? Well, what about the contemporary English version? Does the contemporary English version agree with Sam Harris? Death is the punishment for attacking your father or mother.
the Complete Apostles Bible. Whoever strikes his father or mother, let him be certainly put to death. The Catholic Public Domain Version 2009 Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall die a death. The Doe Rhymes Version He that striketh his father or his mother shall be put to death. No English version it says, He who talks back to his father or mother shall be put to death. And certainly none of them say, Any child who talks back to his parents shall surely be put to death. Therein lies the problem, because what he's doing is dishonest. What he's doing is lying to you about what the Bible says in order to support his thesis that Christianity and Islam are violent, and from there that all religions are violent except the ones he cherry-picks not to be. And keep in mind, Sam Harris, as well as Christopher Hitchens and uh, Hector Avalos and others, uh, claim that we cannot blame atheism for the atrocities committed by communists. And his rationale is that while these regimes may have been against organized religion, they were not particularly rational. And it is not a, an excess of rationality that led to their atrocities. No one argues that they were too rational and that rationality led to their atrocities. If one were to argue that atheism led to their atrocities. One is not arguing that rationality led to these atrocities. Unless, of course, someone believed that rationality and atheism are synonymous with each other. Which does seem to be what Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dinnett, Richard Dawkins, Hector Avalos, and others actually believe. They believe that atheism and rationality are essentially the same thing, even though they define atheism as a lack of belief in a god. They treat atheism as another word for rationality. They also treat atheism and rationality as synonyms for science. So, being scientific means being rational, being rational means being an atheist, that means that being scientific means being an atheist. This also explains why they contrast a scientist to a religious person in their works. As if a scientist is by definition an atheist. And of course, just as Sam Harris did with tolerant religious people by saying that it is actually secularism that makes them tolerant, not religion. Uh, they have an excuse for how a religious person can be a scientist. Uh, to them, science and religion are mutually exclusive and hostile to each other. Sam Harris and uh, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins even said that scientists have a moral duty to oppose religion and to inform the public of the conflict between science and religion, and how irrational religion is, and how we should believe in science instead. So it's obvious that, from their point of view, a scientist is an atheist who opposes religion. But why should we believe that? Of course, you could bring up that there are many scientists who are religious. And I'm using their terminology and distinctions here. I actually think of militant atheism as a form of religion. I'm not, of course, saying atheism is a religion, but even if I were, you can't prove me wrong about atheism being a religion just by saying, atheism is not a religion. Atheism is a lack of belief in a god. Atheism is a religion like not collecting stamps is a hobby. In fact, if I were to argue that atheism is a religion, Reciting that 
would be evidence that I'm right, not that I'm wrong. Just as, repeating another version of it, Atheism isn't a religion, atheism is a lack of belief in a god, nothing more. Or, atheism is an opinion only on one question, is... Simply that, it's a repetition of what you heard someone else say. And again, if you're going to go about equating atheism to reason, and reason to science, and you have all of these statements you make, which make it blindingly obvious that you have a list of beliefs you think a secular person believes in, then it's obvious that when you say, I am an atheist, you don't mean, I merely lack belief in a god and don't have anything else added to it. And it's equally obvious when you go about calling everything reason or rational that's associated with you, such as the largest meeting that you would hold being called a reason rally, that you do obviously equate reason and rationality with atheism, just as you equate skepticism with atheism. That's why it's called the skeptic community, and why you have another event called a skepticon. These are very obvious facts that we are supposed to both acknowledge and ignore, depending upon how well they fit the narrative of the moment. But they still justify religious people being involved in the science, not uh, by admitting that they're wrong about the conflict between religion and science, but by saying that religious people who work in the sciences compartmentalize. They never subject their religious beliefs to their scientific thinking and critical methodology, and they never inflict their scientific thinking with their religious woo-peddling. Where's the evidence that this happens? Well, it's obvious since religion and science are incompatible. If someone is religious and works in the science, they must be compartmentalizing since we know that science and religion are incompatible and hostile. How do we know that religion and science are incompatible and hostile? Well, religious people believe that evolution isn't true. Religious people oppose stem cell research. Religious people a long time ago believed the earth is flat. That's basically how it goes. And I don't really find those arguments convincing because they're not engaging in real history, they're not engaging in what people actually believe, they're not even looking at differences between different groups of religious people or differences between different groups of Christians. They only bring those differences up to make the stupid religious diversity argument that says since the world has a lot of religions, God can't exist and all religions must be false, since if God existed, everyone would have the same religion or the nonsensical idea that somehow religious diversity is a problem specifically for Christians, or that religious belief is inherently violent, which they love to promote and which is actually the point here. They don't actually go about proving any of this, they simply assert it as if it's a well-known, well-established fact and expect you to go along with it but I'm not going to go along with it. I'm not going to pretend that all religious people are the same, at least in that they all promote violence, they all believe that there is only one holy book written by the creator of the universe and it's theirs. I'm not going to pretend things I know are false are true, just like I'm not going to pretend that when they claim that Christians are dishonest, for claiming credit for the abolition movement when it was really non-religious people, atheists, agnostics, and deists, inspired by the Enlightenment who first opposed slavery, uh, based upon the Enlightenment's philosophy and the rights of man, and that only sometime after that did any Christians uh, condemn slavery like Quakers, and they came from radical churches, and even then, their radical church actually supported and defended slavery, all because the Bible condones slavery and calls it good, and only a tiny minority within the radical churches broke from their official church teaching that slavery was good to oppose it, and that no church in America opposed slavery until 1840, and how all the leaders were infidels who rejected Christianity. None of that's true. I mean, they cite atheist leaders like 
or at the very least non-Christian leaders who opposed uh, slavery and fought for abolition, like William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and Susan B. Anthony, they will say with a straight face that these three rejected Christianity. Douglass, they'll claim, was more of a humanist when he died, and say of him that he said, praise infidelity, and how he obviously rejected Christianity as an evil religion, and how devout Christian slave masters were the most cruel, and they will point to a handful of quotes from William Lloyd Garrison and say he was very clearly someone who rejected Christianity, and will claim that all of the Christians hated him and wanted to kill him, and that it was the infidel Abner Neeland in his infidel hall who let him speak, not churches, and they'll talk about Susan B. Anthony being friends with uh, Elizabeth Staten Caddy and founding the suffragettes movement, and it was clearly not a Christian, but all three were Christians. They're misrepresenting their beliefs. And as far as Douglas is concerned, they even have a fish story where they take a quote from him and say, he praised Robert Ingersoll for being moral, and they take that into becoming, he often praised uh, inf uh, Ingersoll as being moral, to he was close friends with Robert Ingersoll. And of course, he wasn't close friends with Ingersoll. He, I think, met him a couple of times, but he was not friends with him. Uh, he did not praise Ingersoll's morality very often, and the one quote they use was actually not praising Ingersoll for being moral at all. It was actually condemning certain specific church leaders for not being moral by claiming that Ingersoll is more moral than they are. But it is important to note that he did not claim all church leaders were immoral. He was not saying, the Christian church is immoral, the Christian pastors and priests and leaders are immoral. He was only talking to and about specific ones that were claiming to be for abolition, but who would not let him speak in a public venue for fear of social ostracization. And what he said about Ingersoll being more moral than them would not make sense if he actually saw Ingersoll as moral. What you're saying is this good moral man Ingersoll is more moral than you are, but you can still be a moral person and be less moral than another moral person. The point Douglas was actually making in that quote was that Ingersoll is an immoral man, but he is more moral than you. That's what makes it an insult. And they turn that into him praising Ingersoll for being moral, which is silly. It's silly to claim that Abner Neelan ran an infidel hall when he actually ran a church. It is true that uh, Neeland's beliefs were outside of mainstream Christianity. He was a pantheist. He believed in universal salvation. Uh, and he held a certain other beliefs that were a little odd. But it is not true that he would not be in any way considered a Christian. And if you actually read the address given on July 4th uh, by... William Lloyd Garrison, he speaks of abolition as a Christian duty. He says that it is a Christian's responsibility before God to do this. And while he does say things like Christianity has done nothing to help the plight of the slave, if you actually read what he's saying, he's doing that to shame people into action rather than condemning the Christian religion as being supportive of slavery. In his view, Christianity is opposed to the type of slavery that the Africans were subjected to. Uh, he was not condemning the actual religion, he was condemning the inaction of certain people. And that's not the same thing. And it is impossible to read that address and come away thinking he's not a Christian. Just like it's silly to think a Quaker like Susan B. Anthony was an atheist. And yet they claim that, just as they claim a certain other person whose name I shan't use but will call in this video Mr. Wolf, was a Christian because they want the villains of history to be Christians. Mr. Wolf, of course, had a funny little moustache and ran a socialist party dedicated to nationalism in Germania. 
And I apologize for these euphemisms, but Al Gore thinks that the real terms upset his rhythm, if you know what I'm saying. And I will be using other euphemisms for other groups of people that I trust the audience who has endured this long uh, will understand our stand-ins for other things to avoid certain problems with Al Gore, who really hates his rhythm being interrupted. And I am talking about Mr. Wolf. The claim, of course, is that Mr. Wolf was a devout Christian. Mr. Wolf was, in fact, specifically a devout Catholic. That his anti-Elvenism, another euphemism you'll have to forgive because of Al Gore, he does not like his rhythm being interrupted. And that it was centuries of Christian anti-Elvenism that uh, fueled both the Catholic and Protestant traditions that led inexorably to Mr. Wolf. They even have quotes from Mr. Wolf and his book, This Struggle of Mine, again, forgive the euphemism. But the real question is, did Mr. Wolf actually say and mean what they claim he did? And was he actually a devout Christian? Was he actually a devout Catholic? And did the Catholic Church actually support him? It is very common, of course, to see them claim that he turned education over to the Catholic Church, that he implemented church dogma into law, and that the Vatican endorsed everything he did, and that it was the Vatican running the rat lines after the war ended to get the socialists of the worker party in Germania that believed in nationalism out of the country. And, of course, Protestants aren't innocent either, because they hated the elves just as much as Catholics do. Both Catholics and Protestants uh, believed that the elves killed Jesus, they were irredeemably evil, and that they could simply not be saved and needed to be done away with. Luther, of course, wrote a book on the elves and their lies, which was extraordinarily impactful on Christian history, and was still a very prominent cause for a Christian anti-Elvenism in the Protestant and Christian world, and Hitler, the devout Catholic, named Luther as one of his personal heroes, and how of the elves and their lies gave us a seven-point plan for the elves, and the Nationalist Party of German Workers' Socialism decided to revive Luther's seven-point plan for the elves, and the 25 points of the Nationalist Party of Workers for Socialism in Germania was nothing more than a modern revival of Luther's own seven-point plan for the elves, with new things added, and it's just obviously true that Christian anti-Elvenism was responsible and to blame, and that the Catholic Church itself, in all of its vile evilness, maintained anti-Elvenism as official church dogma until 1962, when they held an official church congress, Vatican II, and changed it. And, of course, this is no more true than what they say about pollution. Uh, for one thing, the Catholic Church has never held an official church congress. Vatican II is a church council, and I don't care if you think that's a nitpick over words. It's not, but I'm not going to go into it. But it's as stupid as to say that that's a nitpick over mere words, as it is to say that evangelicals won't listen to any sort of reason. They will only listen to what their priests tell them. And then, if someone were to tell you evangelicals don't have priests, respond with that it doesn't matter if they call them pastors or priests. That's just a job title. As if there's just the word that you're objecting to, when it really isn't. Especially considering that the atheist community nitpicks word usage all the time. And of course makes fun of me for randomly capitalizing words in my bad grammar. Which must be true, because the super smart, brilliant people in the atheist community would definitely know if I was following a pattern, and they don't see a pattern, so it must be RANDOM capitals. 
And since they are all freethinkers, they're not just jumping on me as a tribe. And, of course, I lie every time I tell them why I do it, because, well, I'm an apologist, and I'm dishonest, and I'm religious. But nevertheless, I tell them a lie to excuse my random capitals. I tell them it's not random, but that's obviously a lie, because it is. And I tell them I'm legally blind, and that I'm dyslexic, and I use a pattern of English that was influenced by earlier forms of English writing, that was more closely related to the German, that I actually capitalized nouns and modifiers, and that I actually do so to help my eyes focus. All of that's lies. I'm not legally blind. I'm not dyslexic. I'm just an idiot with bad grammar who randomly capitalizes words. Besides, if I was actually disabled, that would make the atheist community ableist, and they're not. Christians are the ones that are ableist. You see, Christianity is harmful to people's mental health. It will take someone who has a mental or physical disability and blame them for it, saying that they are choosing to sin. They internalize the guilt, of course, as they try to do as the Christians say. The Christians say, all you need to do is work harder. And if you pray harder and pray and believe hard enough, you can overcome it. And naturally, when you succumb to your problem, the guilt and shame comes in because you are told that it's your fault, that you are choosing to sin, that... The reason you can't focus and concentrate if you have ADHD, the reason you're sad if you're suffering a depression disorder, is because you're choosing to sin, which makes the problem worse. Oh, how terrible is religion! Oh, how terrible is this hateful religion of Christianity! It is damaging people's mental health. So naturally, we can see how Christians lack empathy and Christians lack compassion because they believe in some old book of fairy tales. Good thing we have the ever-tolerant atheist community, for, you see, religion allows you to bypass common human empathy, whereas atheists who have no religion but merely lack belief in a god due to insufficient evidence are able to express empathy and compassion and would never, ever, ever ridicule someone for their disabilities. Not like those evil Christians do. Which is the problem, isn't it? You see, Mr. Wolf was not a devout Catholic. Mr. Wolf was not a Christian. Mr. Wolf did not base his anti-Elvinism on centuries of Christian anti-Elvinism. The Catholic Church did not officially teach anti-Elvinism until 1962 at Vatican II and did not change the teachings on it. They actually condemned anti-Elvinism in the 1100s and several times after that. The Protestants weren't really all that anti-Elvish either, so what they're saying is silly. And while it is true that Mr. Wolf and his party of socialists, workers for nationalism, did use quotes from On the Elves and Their Lies from Martin Luther in their propaganda, this neither proves that the book was still a common reference within society prior to them using it, or that it was particularly influential in the 19th or 20th century, nor does it actually prove that Luther agreed with Mr. Wolf and his Nationalist Party of Socialist Workers for Germania. Rather, if you actually understood what Luther said, you would see sharp differences. Luther, for instance, did not base his anti elvinism on race. Luther said if an elf were to convert to Christianity, well, at least Lutheran Christianity, all of the things that Luther said should be implemented in regards to the elves in him, his seven-point plan for the elves, would be lifted should they convert to Christianity. Luther did not view the situation with the elves as primarily about race, which is very different than what Mr. Wolf viewed them as. Because Mr. Wolf viewed the elves as a distinct 
race with racial traits, racial features, and racial thoughts, and that they were a parasitic race that needed to be eliminated. Luther didn't think that. Luther wasn't concerned with their racial background at all, only the Elvenish religion, which is why Luther is called anti-religios elvo rather than anti-elvish, and you will have to pardon the term. I don't think it will attract Al Gore or his rhythm's attention, should I mention Judaism. Just put an anti in front of it. That would be what Luther is described as, not anti-Elvish. And in reality, if you actually were to look at what Luther said, it's very obvious that the entire intent is to prompt them to convert. I know I'm going to be ridiculed for saying that, and the atheist community would say, Oh, so that makes it okay! I'm not saying it makes it okay. I am, however, saying it is different than what Mr. Wolf believed. And while you can find a quote from Mr. Wolf where he said that the early forerunner for his party based its anti-Elvinism on religion rather than race. If you were to actually read the very next sentence, you would find that Mr. Wolf actually wasn't talking about the early forerunner for his party, he was talking about a different one, and he outright stated that this was a mistake. You should not base your anti-Elvinism on religion rather than race, because someone who is of the Elven race can always be a different religion. They could even be atheists. Uh, Mr. Wolf said that the failure of this party came about because of its emphasis on religion rather than race. So no, he was not expressing his own views, and he was not saying that his anti-Elvinism was based on religion and not race. So that's not true either. And again, while it is true that he used certain select quotations from uh, Martin Luther and his On the Elves and Their Lies, it is not true that he and Luther substantially agreed with each other. It's not even true that Martin Luther gave the world a seven-point plan for the elves. The seven-point plan for the elves is a term that the late Hector Avalos invented and applied to certain things that Luther said, so that he could link it to the 25 points of the Socialist Germanian Workers Nationalist Party. It is not something that Luther actually presented. It was simply in a way to make it sound closer so that you could pretend that it's a continuation. In reality, though, especially by the 19th century, anti elvinism was not particularly a common identifying trait within Christianity, at least as far as the official teachings of the various churches are concerned. I'm not saying that anti-Elvinism did not exist at all in any church's teachings, nor am I saying that no individual Christian or even groups of Christian held anti-Elvinist views. Nor am I claiming that, historically, the elves were never subjected to anti-elvenish bigotry or oppression, but the relationship between Christianity and elvenism is not quite as clear-cut as this narrative makes it out, because there were Christians who opposed anti-Elvinism, and again, uh, mostly what was being opposed was the religion, not the race. Even uh, during the time when the Spanish Inquisition was being held to root out heresy, they did not view 
Elvenism as a heresy. And they were not trying elves as heretics, not in a religious sense. Rather, they had simply banned Christian... They had simply banned Muslims and elves from Spain. But they allowed you to remain if you converted. And it was actually the conversios who were put on trial, not those who continued in open elvenism. And the fear was that some of them had only falsely converted to Christianity whilst secretly continuing to practice elvenism. And no, I am not saying this is okay. I am saying that this is a difference between what happened in Spain with the Spanish Inquisition and with Mr. Wolf and his Nationalist Party of Germanic Socialists. Especially considering that, and again, I'm not saying this as an approval, in some cases they were right and the elves did not truly convert to Christianity. However, the idea that some atheists have floated that Christians believed if you had any elvish blood it was impossible to convert is a lie, and that many of the conversios were never even brought into suspicion. Many of them even attained high social status. Some served the court. Some became bishops and cardinals. It really isn't the truth. To think of them as viewing it as a racial matter or the same as Mr. Wolf and his nationalist Germanian workers socialist party would. And in reality, quite contrary to the narrative they give about it, Mr. Wolf and his Socialist Workers Germanic Party of Nationalism was actually more motivated by the eugenics movement, which again uh, they will dismiss, claiming, of course, that eugenics was a pseudoscience that was actually supported by Christians. I've even heard it argued that Evolution requires belief in natural selection, but eugenicists did not believe in natural selection, they believed in artificial selection. And that's because they were creationists pushing a form of intelligent design, and that it was the Christian church that was pushing eugenics, not atheists, who recognized it as a pseudoscience. Which is odd, because they also loved to lionize certain atheist heroes like Bertrand Russell, or like George Jacob Holyoke, or like Charles Bradloff, the founder of the National Secular Society, or John Dewey, or Margaret Sanger, or uh, Charles Potter. The problem is, all of them promoted eugenics. In fact, of the signers of the First Humanist Manifesto in 1933, most of them supported eugenics, if not all. And while they try and claim that humanism, as understood in the Humanist Manifesto, is a non-religious philosophy that even religious people could agree with, and that it is was actually primarily authored by a Christian, Raymond Bragg, who was a Unitarian minister, which proves that a theist who believed in God and who was actually a Christian helped author it, proving that Christians can believe in it, they seem to ignore the fact that the Humanist Manifesto itself is openly and explicitly atheist, saying the time has passed for theism, deism, and new thought, and claiming that we should do away with those sorts of beliefs. Although the Humanist Manifesto also openly declares humanism as a religion. Well, the truth is Raymond Bragg may have been a Unitarian minister, but he was an atheist. And if you read his works, which you can find on the Internet Archive, this is obvious. John Dietrich was also an atheist and a humanist, and he also promoted eugenics. And please keep in mind, I'm not saying absolutely no Christian promoted eugenics, 
But one of the weird things about the atheist community is that it acts as if you can find two or three Christians who supported eugenics, thus proving THE Christian Church supported eugenics, or that support for eugenics was primarily in the church, or at the very least, that religion didn't matter at all and you had everyone promoting it. In reality, though, when eugenics was being promoted by people like Major Leonard Darwin or Julian Huxley, who, by the way, also founded UNESCO with this in mind, or by other people such as Charles Potter or John Dewey or really even Bertrand Russell or others, you will find that they would criticize the churches for opposing eugenics. Even one of the creators of the science versus religion conflict theory, John Draper, not only believed in eugenics, but openly supported it through his institute, the Draper Institute. He did eugenical research, after all. And Draper used the Christian opposition to eugenics to prove science and religion had a warfare going on between them. The same theme happens when you read McCabe, who was one of the most prolific authors of the period. He claimed that the Christian church got in the way of progress and scientific advancement, which is a common theme you still hear in atheist circles today. But one of the points is that the primary opposition to full implementation of eugenic policies came from the Christian churches, which he obviously, obviously hated. This is one of the people who also claims that William Lloyd Garrison was a non-Christian theist, and in his Encyclopedia of Rationalists, or rather, his biographic Encyclopedia of Modern Rationalists from 1948 says that while Christians claim William Lloyd Garrison as one of their own and as a Christian hero, he was actually an opponent and they actually hated and even wanted to kill him, and that he was actually a rationalist and freethinker who was a non-Christian theist. And there is a note in, in that where it is obvious that he finds being a non-Christian theist as disappointing. He would prefer Garrison to have been an atheist, but he wasn't. But still, at least he was no Christian. And so it's obvious that McCabe does not like Christianity. He speaks much more about why Christianity is evil than why rationalists are good. His entries on rationalists are usually shorter than his critical ones on various Christians. He also, by the way, uh, praises Vladimir Lenin, calls Karl Marx the father of modern socialism, and uh, even praises Stalin, uh, claiming that he is one of the great statesmen of Europe. You can find this in the 1948 edition of the Biographical Encyclopedia of Modern Rationalists, which was released in 1948. It is freely available on the Internet Archive. The edition that I found was a reprint from 1950, but from the 1948 original. You can easily look up what I'm saying and find that it is true. Uh, so that's why it's so odd when you have people like Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens claiming communism is actually a form of religion and that atheists are not to blame for it. In fact, religion is to blame. Because had Sam Harris been alive when McCabe was, he would be praising communism as a secular philosophy. Of course, if Sam Harris was around in that time period, he would also believe people of African descent were inferior to whites, and would also believe that eugenics would create a superman, and that we needed to at least segregate, if not eliminate, the inferior races. Which I know he would believe, because he's using the same arguments from the 19th century free thought movement. He did not simply look at the facts and draw his own conclusion that is the same as them. So it's fairly obvious that his narrative has changed, but it does beg the question. 
uh, they are claiming that religion is inherently and uniquely violent. But every secular alternative historically that was said to be less violent turned out to be more violent and was dismissed as not having anything to do with atheism years later. In fact, years later, it was called a religion so that they could do away with it while still blaming religion for all the world's woes and preaching that if we all could just become secular and give up religion, we'd have a better world. I don't really believe the people who need to rewrite history and manipulate it and come up with sophistic arguments where they act as if their descriptions of things are real arguments about how the real world works. There is simply no reason to think people motivated by hatred of Christianity, even the ones who claim to have family and friends they deeply love who are Christian therefore can't hate Christians, but who obviously do hate Christians because all they ever talk about is how evil and psychopathic Christians are, could ever bring about a peaceful world. They are motivated by hate. And that is one thing that, even though they'll say is true of Christians, really isn't. And it isn't even true that Islam is necessarily so. I think I've said enough, though, so... I shall sign off now. Thank you, God bless, and uh, goodbye.